It's worth having your screenplay stand out way above the others to ensure its success. But how do you do that? How's it, how's it? This is Chuck from Screenplay Prep and how do you raise your screenplay above the rest? In the noise of screenplay submissions these days, how do you get yours to stand above the rest? How is it that yours, on that weekend's reading by your script reader, does it get to the top of the pile? Beyond the merits of a good and solid story, which is very difficult for a screenplay service to fix, they can point problems out, certainly, and if you want brute honesty, honesty can also tell you that no one's really going to be interested in your story of your old grandmother's Oldsmobile back in the 50s. So beyond that, let's assume a story is standard. How do you then ensure that you can take it to a level that makes it stand out amongst the others? Therefore, what we need to look at is essentially details. It's those extra bits. It's going that extra mile. Now this is a very difficult concept for many because when you spent months or years working on your screenplay, writing away in your writer's cabin or wherever it may be, you get to a point where you're done. You've labored sweat and tears and you just want to get it out there. You want to push it to the competition or the agent, pass it to people to read, whatever it might be and you just want to see the back of it, however much you love it. It's at this point that it really merits leaving it alone in a drawer for two weeks to a month and then coming back to it to do the final passes. And it's my suggestion that in one of these passes, you take that magnifying glass and you go that extra mile to do those little edits and checks that are labor laborsome, boring, and the things you might not think to do. So what am I getting at here? Let's take a simile. In a restaurant scenario, a meal can be presented on a plate and the potatoes mashed up and shoved next to the vegetables and the gravy poured all over the top. And there it sits. Well, it smells good and it probably tastes good too. However, if the chef made the extra effort and created a piece of artwork on that plate and perhaps put the mashed potato as a base layer, piling other elements on top, garnishing with color and trying to balance that presentation and sprinkling some element of spice around the edge of the plate. When that is presented, although it's probably going to taste fairly similar, it's going to leave a much bigger impression on that diner's imagination. Psychologically, they've been given something that is embodying a sense of care, attention, and love. And as a result, that diner is most likely going to want to come back again. So in the same way with your screenwriting, you want to go to that level where you rearrange your writing. And this is most notably, notably going to be in places like your action and description. So outside the scope of screenplay formatting, whereby you may already have gone via a service, but ideally always leave that to the very, very end. We're not looking so much at formatting issues. We're looking at the best arrangement of sentences. So let's take a look at this example. This is a sample screenplay where I'm going to demonstrate the kind of level you can take your editing to beyond what might seem like a satisfactory edit. So what we look at here could be submitted and of course may well get through the Hollywood reader's discretion uh, or even a producer or a studio. However, if this screenplay is up against 10 or 20 others and they're all good, so from a story perspective, they're all on the mark, they're all interesting, but the reader has to put five positive screenplays on the desk on Monday morning, how does this one get through? So this is where we take things to the next level. And this is going to seem like nitpicking, 
But that's the level you need to go to. If things seem easy when you're writing, well, that's great if writing flows. But if, if you are taking the easy way out of a screenplay scenario, you've got yourself in a fix, then it's probably not a good thing. Cutting corners and things being easy isn't always a good thing. So to stand out, you just need a sense of excellence. So the first thing I'm noticing here is this. So we want to swap to the present active tense. Although this is acceptable, uh, some people may say correct, you can go one further, you can do one better by changing this to, so we're gonna delete is, and we're gonna swap seated to Bob sits in the back seat of a London taxi. So this is active, this is what's happening now, it's exactly what the camera is recording. So if you can write in the present active, then you are giving a, a sense of what is happening right now, and it reads just that little bit better. So here his brown hair is neatly combed. See, another thing is for explicitness, you could say and wears, but it could imply that his hair wears a red jacket. But neatly combed, and he wears a red jacket over his blue and white checked shirt and blue jeans. Here's another thing. The sun is beginning to shine. Now this is a correction I did actually make earlier. It's better to put this as the sun breaks the clouds and shines. Begins to and suddenly are not great ways to inform your action. Things don't necessarily suddenly happen. I often give the example of someone walking through the forest and suddenly a twig snaps. A twig just simply snaps. And the begins to usage, the sun begins to shine. I mean, it, it's such a fraction of a second that you're trying to describe by saying begins to. It is just so much better just to say the sun breaks the clouds and shines. I have also set this in its own paragraph. So by doing a return here, setting that like that declares that it has to be a new shot. So the camera, whether it's the same camera or not, doesn't really matter. That's up to the cinematographers to work out. But the point is, this second paragraph means essentially this is a different shot. So rather than trying to get the point of view from the taxi, you know, Bob is sitting there. So we need to be seeing Bob. We need to see his hair and what he's wearing. And from that position to see the sun breaks, the clouds and shines, not so great. It's a good thing to declare that as a second shot, which means it emphasizes that activity. Okay, so his voiceover, I took a taxi to the station. So Bob is at the ticket counter. Yeah, he's at the ticket counter. It's very, as it were, language. It's too basic. So let's swap this to Bob stands at the ticket counter. Now, depending on his emotions and what he's doing here, you could emphasize this. Is he twitchy? Is he being chased? In which case, you might be standing a little differently. You might be urgent and foot hopping and impatient and twitching. If so, say so. So if he's at the ticket counter, he's probably buying a ticket. I mean, you don't need to declare he's buying a ticket. Bob stands at the ticket counter. It goes on when, with the dialogue anyway to say that he's buying the ticket. So another thing, just don't repeat. It's the kind of thing for the reader that just gets a little boring when you're stating what's then stated. So there is the sound of is not a good thing. This is a reminder that we're watching a movie or reading an instruction manual to make a movie. You want this to be a nice smooth read. Let's go with the ticket machine was. That implies it's printed. You don't, you don't need to say it's printed. It is handed to Bob. He pays for the ticket with his credit card and takes it. Now this is a little ambiguous. Takes what, his credit card or the ticket? The reality is, how important is it to say exactly what happens? The actors can work that out uh, beyond that. It's not crucial. The reality is what happens. They film and the sound engineer makes sure he's got a microphone near the ticket machine. What kind of noise does the ticket machine make? 
it's a ticket transaction. If you want it to be further explicit, then be so. He pays the ticket with his credit card and retrieves both items. Here is an example where you would be mixing your present and present active tenses. So if we're going with this present active tense and making everything very much as is now, then you need to be consistent. You need to go through your whole screenplay and correct this. The train waits on the platform. I would say the train waits at the platform. Niggly, sure, but it's the kind of thing that just makes the reading flow. And if you do have a reader who's particularly full of scrutiny, his brain might think, hang on, does a train sit on a platform or at a platform? You're just removing that possibility by correcting that. Bob joins the line of people boarding the train. Their breath fog up in the cold, damp air. And we're correcting the names for consistency when he gets in. So yes, Charlie's being changed to Bob. Now, the doors close behind Bob, I would say after he gets in. At this point, I would make a new line, a whistle. That's the thing that's making the sound. So uppercase. And the train begins to move. Removing words might seem insignificant, but it does make things smoother and more efficient. Uppercase for sounds. Some people don't do it. Uh, historically, they did. But I still think there's an advantage. So what happens is when this gets to production, is that a production assistant goes through the screenplay, looking at the action description blocks, and his job is specifically to pick out what's going on that needs attention. So he therefore, or she, looks out for uppercase mentions, which will indicate some special effects or sound effects, or of course, the new characters that are taking part in the scene. Here we have an example of the use of as. It's one of my pet peeves. Uh, as this, then that, all of it. It's, it happens too often, too many people do it, so it becomes like a staple diet. So when the Hollywood reader sits there on the weekend with 20 scripts and 17 of them keep doing that as this, as that, this happens as that, it gets a little tedious. Sure, it's correct. People may say it in real life, um, but this is the movies. There is, there's artistic license as much as the opportunity just to be a little more exciting. Reality is you don't need to say as. You just simply say, the train speeds away and Bob sits next to the window and relaxes. There's loads more that there that we can look at, but I'm hoping that that is enough to give you the beginnings of an idea as to what you can do to tighten things up. I just now want to look at word order, because this is something else you can do to bolster your writing. So something may read correctly in terms of English uh, grammar, but there's always a chance that it could be better. And this brings me to the notion of that'll do. It's good enough. Well, this video is about standing out. So good enough and that'll do, do not qualify. You've got to be better than that. So if you want to stand out, you've got to be better. So let's just find an example. This is partly a, a technicality rather than grammatical order and whether it can be better or not. What I want to bring to your attention here is that when you read this back, and we're looking at this paragraph here, when you read this back, you've got to think of the filming of it. You've got to imagine yourself on set, ideally as the cameraman. If this Inspector Gorse is in the bathroom and he points at the bathtub and then you're saying the shower curtain is drawn back. Well, had the shower curtain not been drawn back, he wouldn't be able to point at the bathtub filled with soapy water. Again, maybe niggly, but what I would do is cut that sentence, paste it to the beginning. So you're establishing the open way and then that the inspector points at what's behind the drawn back curtain. Now here, and it has, it's too much uh, and it just trips the sentence a little. 
There is a stand with shelves next to the tub with bottles of lotions, bath salts and some soaps in their covers. Let's look for one more section of an opportunity to rearrange the language. Okay, here's a, another section. So we're in a church. The village church is full to capacity. So we're looking here. It just doesn't read as smoothly as it could do. The wooden coffin with flowers on the top is in the center in front of the pulpit. It, it doesn't flow. So the wooden coffin, you could even, wooden coffin, comma, flowers on top sits center in front of the pulpit. The Anglican priest, now on the pulpit implies he's standing on the top where typically his book or notes would lie, as if he's about to jump off. At. The Anglican priest, the Anglican priest is at the pulpit giving his sermon. So you've got an example here of just switching the language for accuracy and then just rearranging things a bit to read better. So th this example is about flow. The prior, before I corrected it, may well have worked in filming. The, the, the crew might have set things up correctly and they would have filmed what the screenwriter meant. However, this just reads better. Following on, Bob sits in the front row and so on. So when you do this kind of work, be really self-critical. And the best way to do that is having left your screenplay in the drawer or on the hard drive for two weeks to a month where your brain can kind of move on a little bit and then you come back to it a little fresher. And at that point, it is much easier to be more critical of your own work and just go through sentence by sentence and just work out, can this be better? Can this be more efficient? Can it be clearer? And am I being consistent? I hope looking at that fictitious scene brings it home to, you, home to you and gives you a sense of what I'm talking about in taking things from here to here and then separating you above the rest. It might seem nitty gritty and over the top, but with the number of submissions there are these days, that's what you need to do to leave that reader or agent with that impression that, wow, this screenwriter really cares. They kind of went overboard, but it just reads so perfectly. It just gives a sense that you want to win and you want to make their lives easier and potentially also more interesting by providing a more natural and flowing read. I thoroughly recommend this, uh, very much worth doing. And it is something you can get help with but ultimately, if you can reread your screenplay effectively with a magnifying glass and just go through each action block and work out, is that the best way of presenting this? Is there another way of saying it? Am I being boring by saying Bob stands there at the counter when you could give something more? You know, how is he standing? What's the emotion at this point? And just turning those phrases around to give a little bit more impact. I hope that's useful and get in touch if you need help with this kind of work and I'll see you in the next video. If you found that video useful, please consider liking and subscribing. That will tell YouTube that I'm worth watching and ensures I can produce more educational content into the future.